On today's Winning Cures Everything, is Notre Dame getting $75 million or will they have to join the Big Ten? More conflicting reports on Pac-12 media rights, Michigan State high-profile transfers, of course, college football playoff dates, SEC scheduling, Big 12 innovation, Brian Kelly gives bulletin board material, and more. Football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything, powered by BetUS, where we talk college football news and rumors all year round. I'm Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. This is the May 5th, Friday edition of the show. It's Season 8, Episode 27. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, thank you. And if you would so kindly, please go ahead and hit that like button. And whether you're watching or listening to the podcast, hit subscribe so you never miss the latest tales from the college football universe. All right, I got to tell y'all, it has been a crazy year to be an Alabama fan. Had two of the top three NFL draft picks, but didn't make the SEC championship game or the playoff in football. Basketball makes the Sweet 16, uh, wins the SEC regular season and the the basketball tournament. Uh, But they were the number one overall seed. You've got a likely top three pick in the NBA draft, hoping for the second every Elite Eight appearance and first Final Four. And of course, there was the criminal disaster in the middle of the season, so that wasn't easy to get through. Now you've got, of course, uh, Ohio, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Indiana all stopping action on Alabama baseball games due to, quote, suspicious activity. Uh, In the early parts of the investigation, the university's AD, Greg Byrne, has released a statement that the school has fired the head coach, Brad Bohannon. Like, this is this is nuts. Uh, The suspicious, suspicious, excuse me, uh, betting activity came from the weekend series as Alabama was playing number one LSU. Uh, Alabama was never going to be favored to win any of those games. It was on the road. The suspicious activity that has been reported was happening uh, was at the BetMGM inside of the Cincinnati Reds ballpark. And apparently, Bohannon was in communication with someone that put down a big bet on LSU right before it was announced that Alabama's starting pitcher was a scratch. Like, they had it on video surveillance that Bohannon was talking to the guy. Like, what a completely idiotic way to lose your job. Like, that is one of the more moronic things that a coach could ever do. Uh, Alabama did come back after Bohannon was fired and won the first game of a series against number 5 Vanderbilt last night in blowout fashion. So who's to say that if Bohannon has not been, you know, betting against his own team, uh, that this team wouldn't be in a much better position than they are right now? Uh, But here's a question for you. Like, does it ever get caught if sports gambling was not regulated? Like, there's a lot of people throwing around comments about how, you know, this is proof that sports gambling is uh, is bad just because one dummy got caught up in something and uh, did something he's not supposed to do. Like, I don't think that that means that gambling overall is bad for sports. It gives people a rooting interest. It helps drive even more engagement to these sports. Like, you can look at the rising viewership across football, basketball, and baseball. Um, but anyway, it, it's been a wild year in Tuscaloosa. We'll move along. Congrats to Pat McAfee, of course, and his wife, Sam, on the birth of their uh, their new daughter. Uh, this is awesome for the McAfees. I'm curious to see exactly how much Pat is going to change over the next few years. All you dads out there know, kids have a way of making you see the world a little differently, right? Uh, so cheers to them on a uh, momentous occasion. Uh, I'm excited for those guys. All right. Uh, I, I don't normally vouch for other podcasts. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you all to make sure uh, that you go to SplitZoneDuo.com and pay for the subscription version of the SZD podcast. Stephen Godfrey went for nearly two hours on Hugh Freeze last Friday, and it was maybe one of the best podcasts that I have listened to maybe ever. Like It, it took me back to when I was actually writing articles for Winning Cures Everything, and all of my conversations with uh, Barney Farrar's lawyer, with Houston Nutt attorney Tom Mars, uh, among others that were connected with what was going on with the Ole Miss NCAA situation around Hugh Freeze and Ross Bjork, et cetera. I, I wrote no less than, I, I would say, probably 30, 40 articles about that situation, and Godfrey was right dead in the middle of it. So uh, go support their show. Listen to that specific podcast. It is 
brilliant. It is really well done. Uh, he just lets it all out. It, it's it's awesome. Uh, we got a lot to discuss in the world of college football, so so let's go ahead and uh, and get to it. Um, first off, here let's write down times. Of course, you you would think after after all this time away from the podcast that I'd be a little better prepared. But regardless, uh, here we go. Uh, could Notre Dame be joining the Big Ten? Like, what is going to happen once their TV contract expires in 2025? Dick Weiss from the New York Daily News tweeted this last weekend. He said, Notre Dame wants $75 million annually in new media rights contract from longtime broadcast partner NBC. Existing deal currently worth around $22 million per year, slated to expire in 2025. And then he said, when was the last time the Irish won a title? Now, this stirred up a lot of talk about what NBC and the Irish are going to do, Right. Notre Dame has had a contract with NBC dating back to 1991, but jumping from $22 million to $75 million per year right after NBC signed uh, you know, with the Big Ten to do a Big Ten game on Saturday nights, I am not so sure that NBC is going to be willing to pay it after agreeing to pay, like if I remember right, somewhere around like $350 million per season to the Big Ten. So the big thing here will be what are Notre Dame's viewership numbers? Uh, per front office sports back in August, when all of this stuff initially came out, uh, it was said that uh, Notre Dame would want $75 million. There was another report about $60 we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But either way, a, a report from November 2021 revealed viewership for Notre Dame's football games was down 48% year over year with an average of 2.5 million viewers. Uh, the team did, however, bring in a record streaming audience during the season. So I suppose if you're going to somebody that has a streaming platform, Maybe that's good. In 2020, Notre Dame produced the most viewers that they've had since 2005. But the year before that, in 2019, viewership hit a record low for NBC with 2.1 million viewers on average. The best average viewership Notre Dame was able to put up was in the pandemic season, 2020, when they were undefeated in the regular season. They had the Clemson game at home on the same night that Joe Biden was announced the winner of the presidency. And... It just so happened to be the season that they were actually playing in a conference. Something to think about. All in all, uh, the numbers are actually pretty good. I mean, if you can average over $2 million per game against not great competition, I mean, that means that you are a major draw. And everybody obviously already knew this about Notre Dame. But is that worth $75 million a year to NBC? I mean, you were talking well over $10 million per game. Uh would it possibly be worth that to CBS, who also just signed their afternoon slots with the Big Ten? ABC and ESPN already have plenty of inventory, and they're not going to overpay for this, as evidenced by the Pac-12 situation, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Uh, but let's look at who Notre Dame already has on their home schedule going forward. You look at 2025, you got two monsters on there. you got Texas A&M and USC. But along with that, you got Purdue, Navy, NC State, and Syracuse. In 2026, Nothing jaw dropping. I mean, you got Virginia, Michigan State, and Syracuse, and while those are brands, I don't know what they're really worth. In 2027, you got Purdue, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, and Navy. Okay. In 2028, Arkansas, Boston College, Clemson, and Miami, Florida. And in 2029, you've got Alabama, Georgia Tech, Wake Forest, and Navy. So in 2029, you've got a monster game against Alabama over the season. Uh, but you know opening weekend is going to have a ton of competition, which could hurt those numbers. Although I would expect a massive number regardless. Expectations are, of course, that it likely won't be Nick Saban roaming the sidelines for Alabama at that point. Although, I mean, who could say at this point? Uh, the USC series is not on the book past 2026 right now. Are there enough marquee home games to make the deal worth $75 million? I don't know that I can say that definitively right now. Uh, you know that they'll get back, you know, they'll they'll... They'll backfill uh, to get to at least six home games each season. But the additional games are likely going to be ones like they've got for the next two seasons, right? At Tennessee State, Central Michigan, Miami of Ohio, Northern Illinois, etc. Like, not to mention the fact that it may be more difficult to schedule marquee P5 games with all the scheduling changes coming up in the future. SEC potentially moving to nine, uh, my, excuse me, nine conference games, etc. Uh an idea that maybe could help Notre Dame, and you guys are going to love this, maybe the Pac-12, might be for some of them to sign, or, or maybe just the conferences to sign, some kind of agreement so that you know teams like Oregon, Washington, Utah, etc. could all play against the Irish. Uh, it would create some more interesting matchups, 
for both of them, right? If you'd be home and homes with these teams year in and year out, that could help. If Notre Dame wants their schedule to be appealing enough to get a big contract, like the $75 million that they want, they're going to need bigger names. I can, I can almost guarantee that Fox and ESPN will not be interested. But if CBS and NBC are in the game, does new Big Ten Commissioner Tony Petiti talk with NBC and CBS about making it clear to Notre Dame that they are going to be better off joining the Big Ten? After the initial report last fall about the Irish wanting $75 million per season, Sports Business Journal is who reported that they are likely to fetch around $60 million per year. Is that enough for Notre Dame to stay relevant and competitive? I think so. Uh, I think that they would likely take that, even if it means that they're giving up a chunk of cash to join the Big Ten. Although, you know, we've reached a point where there are enough entities involved that could be pushing Notre Dame to join a conference. And while everybody is focused on the Irish potentially joining the Big Ten, uh, and of course how certain ACC teams are going to try and get out of their deal to join with the SEC or the Big Ten, are we sure that the ACC wouldn't be able to renegotiate their current deal with Disney if they were to pull in Notre Dame and one other school? Like at, at this point in the realignment circus, I don't know that anything is off the table. Uh, but if you could get the ACC to fifty million a year, something like that, would that be worth more to Notre Dame? Like, will Notre Dame even be able to get sixty? That's the question. If they can get sixty, then they're not going to the ACC. If they can get seventy, is it better for them to join the Big Ten? There's a lot. There's a lot at stake here. We're going to see what this looks like. Uh, over the next couple of years. All right, what is the latest going on with the Pac-12? It's a, well here. It, we'll we'll just start off the end cap here. What is the latest going on with the Pac-12? We have got conflicting reports again. So who's right? As always, the answer lies in who benefits from the news being reported. At least we think anyway. Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports has spent a lot of time on this Pac-12 media rights negotiation as news has come in both from anonymous sources and quotes directly from conference presidents. On Wednesday night, Dodd released an article titled Pac-12's Murky Future Finds Shred of Clarity with ESPN appearing as, uh, or excuse me, appearing out as option for primary media rights. Uh, we had heard rumors that ESPN might be out of the negotiations as far back as late February but multiple sources confirmed with CBS that ESPN appears to be out as an option to take the Pac-12's primary media rights. Now, per Dodd's article, the situation developed at the Fiesta Summit spring meetings uh, this, this past week when Big 12 officials were told by ESPN executives that its league was one of three conferences that the network would be airing in the future. ESPN currently has Power 5 agreements with the Big 12. Uh, their new deal begins in 2025. The SEC, their new deal begins in 2024 and the ACC, which is an existing deal that goes through 2036. It has other college football deals as well, including one with the AAC that ends in 2030. A Big 12 administrator who decided he wanted to remain uh, anonymous, or he or she re wanted to remain anonymous, uh, told Dodd, this is the first time publicly that ESPN has said, we're not doing anything with the Pac-12. All right. Obviously, the fact that this is coming from the Big 12, that's not ideal. You would like to hear this news from somebody actually involved in the negotiations or from ESPN as they are the company we're talking about, right? Dodd's article states that the Pac-12 wants $200 million for their Tier 1 content, which would likely be categorized as a minimum of two games a week across 14 weeks. That's $7 million per game. I don't know that ESPN wants to spend $200 million a year on the Pac-12, especially with the NBA, UFC, and the college football playoff all coming up on the horizon. In a way, it's a little bittersweet that the Pac-12 did finally get more access to the CFP because the price that those rights will demand could be what keeps the Pac-12 from getting a better TV deal. Like, ESPN would certainly be more willing to pay $200 million for, like, four playoff games than they would for 28 Pac-12 games. Notre Dame is asking for more than $10 million per home game in their next deal, and the Pac-12 can't get a linear network to pay $7 million per game right now. So let's, let's look again at the sourcing. The news that ESPN is out on the Pac-12, who does that help? Almost certainly the Big 12. Your mark obviously wants some of the Pac-12 to join the Big 12, whether that's the four corner schools or Oregon and Washington, it's a, whatever. He wants that fourth television window in a bad way. But after Dodd's article came out, Ross Dellinger tweeted from the Pac-12 conference meetings, a note from conference meetings in Scottsdale 
ESPN remains in negotiations with the Pac-12 for its primary TV package, multiple sources tell uh, Sports Illustrated. In fact, the league and network held discussions as recently as today. Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic tweeted the exact same thing, said ESPN remains bitter for the Pac-12's Tier 1 rights, a source tells The Athletic, and then she followed that up with the Pac-12 and ESPN met as recently as today. So this is now Schrodinger's cat of media rights negotiations. ESPN being a part of the deal is both alive, uh, or excuse me, ESPN being a part of the deal is both alive and dead until the deal gets done. Now, who would benefit from the news that ESPN is still involved? Obviously, the Pac-12. The more people at the table, the better chances of getting the amount of money that they want. Our back and Dellinger's reports obviously came from the Pac-12, so the news is coming from the Big 12, who wants to expand with West Coast schools, and the Pac-12, who is trying like hell to get a good media rights deal in order to stay competitive in the college football market. Like, But what about this? What if ESPN is telling the Big 12 the truth that they're definitely not going to be taking the Pac-12 rights, but they failed to mention that they only meant at the current price. What if ESPN can get the Tier 1 rights for $150 million per season, and then you've got another streamer, whether Apple or Amazon or whatever, they grab all of the Tier 2 and Tier 3 rights for like $120 million. That gets the Pac-12 to $270 million per season or $27 million per school. If the Big 12 is getting over $31 million per school, that only puts the Pac-12 schools at a little more than 10% below the Big 12. In, in that case, I don't think anybody's going anywhere. Dodd's article also states speculation that NBC Universal, specifically the USA Network, uh, could be involved, which, again, the Pac-12 could get more money out of NBC if NBC believes that ESPN is still at the table. These conflicting reports are driving me insane. Okay, uh, if you're the Pac-12, would it be better to take $175 million from USA Network for Tier 1 rights or $150 million from ESPN? Or since both of those are on cable... What about, let's say, Nexstar, who owns the CW? What if they came to the table with $160 million for the Tier 1 rights? Uh, that's, that's network television. It's over-the-air TV uh, for which you don't need a cable subscription. Like, I, I know this. There does not appear to be an end in sight for these Pac-12 media rights negotiations. We are now into May, and there's been no substantial news one way or the other, or at least anything that you feel like you can trust. Like, all of this is still mind-blowing to me, I'm I'm perplexed. I keep seeing these these articles. I keep seeing sources say, but at this point, who are the sources? I don't know that I'm going to believe anything until we get an actual report out from the Pac-12 that says, hey, here's what we got done. Or when we hear, hey, so-and-so is leaving for the Big 12. Because I that's the way it appears that it's headed right now. All right, Winning Cures Everything is brought to you by BetUS, of course, with fast payouts, fantastic customer service, a myriad of options to bet on, and an easy-to-use layout. It is easy to see why it's been America's favorite online sports book for nearly 30 years. Right now, they're going to give you $50 to play with, with no deposit required, just by signing up and using the link in the description. So take advantage of the deal and get signed up over at BetUS, where the game begins. Also, also make sure and check out my How to Bet series over at BetUSTV.com. And of course, subscribe to the BetUS College Football Show. Uh, that's on YouTube. Parker, Kyle, and myself, I will be coming back in June for some early previews over on that channel. So get subscribed over there as well. All right. Let's talk Michigan State. What is going on in East Lansing? That's what everyone wants to know after some big names hit the portal. But... Could it be just something that was best for these players and nothing to do with the Spartans football program? Last weekend, right at the deadline, Michigan State had multiple players enter the transfer portal, and it wasn't the usual suspects of third stringers and walk-ons. You had cornerback Charles Brantley, quarterback Peyton Thorne, and wide receiver Keon Coleman all enter the portal. Brantley quickly withdrew his name and announced that he's headed back to East Lansing, but the quarterback and wide receiver still remain available on the market. Man, eh, somewhat. Thorne was the quarterback of the 2021-11 win team. His ceiling was obvious in last year's failed 5-7 and seven campaign as he completed 62.5% of his passes. He had 19 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. Yes, he is the incumbent starter for the Spartans, but there had been whispers that Noah Kim was outplaying him in practice. 
And in the spring game, you could kind of see it. Kim obviously had, you know, the four or five best passes on the day. He showed touch, accuracy, et cetera. Thorne was slightly more consistent, but there's a ton of potential with Kim that Thorne just doesn't have at this point. So if we've reached a point where Kim was likely to be the starter, this makes absolute sense for Thorne to look elsewhere, especially with several big programs still needing quarterback help and potential starters, which is exactly why he tra- or he announced that he is transferring to Auburn this morning. I- I'm not sure what I think of Thorne and Hugh Freeze's offense, but I do think he's a better passer than anybody that they've got on the roster right now. It- it's kind of funny when you think about it. Dave Aranda at Baylor is lauded for, for telling his incumbent starter last year uh, or two years ago, Jerry Bohannon, that he would likely get more playing time somewhere else, and he did at, at USF. But in this situation, it happens with Mel Tucker, and everyone immediately starts to question what's wrong in East Lansing. But I digress. Uh, The one transfer that is going to sting is Keon Coleman. Uh, Basketball and football player, he was the most explosive playmaker on the team. He had 798 receiving yards and seven touchdowns, along with averaging nearly 14 yards per catch. Now, Coleman is from Louisiana. Uh, He didn't get an offer from LSU when he was in high school. The talk is that Coleman wants to join the Bayou Bengals, but... Uh, do they have room for him? I mean, that wide receiver room is absolutely stacked, even with losing Butte and uh, and Jenkins from last year. Obviously, a player like Coleman is somebody that you want on your team. Whoever gets him is going to be better for it, but we'll see if it's LSU. I mean, they still got neighbors, Taylor and Thomas, all coming back, along with the younger guys behind them. Uh, is it possible that Coleman could come back to Michigan State if they get an IL sorted? Possibly. Uh, but it looks more and more like he's going to be headed elsewhere. He's He's visiting Florida State this weekend, the Seminoles could certainly use another wide receiver to fill the role of a, uh, of transfer Micah Pittman. Uh, that was a wide receiver they were not planning on having to replace this year. Um, Coleman's going to be visiting Auburn on Sunday. I mean, that makes sense if he wants to go play with his quarterback, Peyton Thorne. Is it possible that, that Coleman just wanted to play with Thorne and that's why he entered the portal to begin with? Here's the weird thing to me. Uh, there are a lot of reports that said that these guys didn't really want to leave East Lansing, but they had to in order to accomplish what they wanted. Like, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? Is it getting paid? Is it winning? Like, I would I would love to get some real details from the players on what they're looking for. But at the end of the day, I don't know that this necessarily means that there's anything really wrong with Mel Tucker's program. I think there's, there's a lot to that idea. All right, on the other side, we're going to talk about confirmed CFP dates. Where does Casey Thompson end up? Uh, the SEC has not decided on a schedule format Brian Kelly, maybe getting a little chesty, and, of course, a whole lot more. Let's check out some things you should know about. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, expert game analysis only on the BetUS TV College football channel. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. We talked about it on the last show a little bit, but we have confirmed dates for the 2024 and 2025 expanded 12-team college football playoff. All right, For the first two years of this expansion, the four quarterfinal games and the two semifinal games will be played midweek in order to avoid going head-to-head with the NFL. Uh, that gives us a ton of days in December and January with high-stakes football in both college and the NFL. So uh, let's go ahead and get to it. We're going to roll through this whole thing. The 2025 CFP dates and locations. In the first round, you're going to have on-campus sites. You got Friday, December 20th, 2024. You got one game that evening. So a Friday night game, pretty good. Saturday, December 21st, 2024, you've got three games. Early afternoon, late afternoon, and evening. Uh, This is the weekend that you would typically see the Las Vegas Bowl, the LA Bowl, New Mexico Bowl, whatever. Uh, I'm curious to see if they will still have those on this date. My guess is probably... But who knows? I mean, those are ESPN-owned entities. We'll see what happens. Now, the quarterfinals. Tuesday, December 31st, 2024, the Fiesta Bowl will be that evening. Wednesday, January 1st, 2025, we'll have the Peach Bowl in the early afternoon, the Rose Bowl in the late afternoon, and the Sugar Bowl that evening. Three playoff games on January 1st is an absolute ratings bonanza. Like, this is going to be incredible to see. It's on the perfect day. 
I, I love this. The semifinals. Thursday, January 9th, 2025, you're going to have the Orange Bowl that evening. Friday, January 10th, 2025, you're going to have the Cotton Bowl that evening. Now, after these two games, you're going to have two NFL regular season games on Saturday and 14 on Sunday, uh, or I guess the NFL wildcard playoff round, depending on how the calendar falls. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of awesome football just right there in that, in that slate. From Thursday all the way probably through Monday, you're going to have a lot of awesomeness going on. Uh, the national championship game is going to be Monday, January 20th, 2025 in Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Uh, this is going to come after an NFL playoff weekend. I would assume it's not going to go head-to-head -head with an NFL Monday night playoff game. But that's going to be, again, a whole lot of high-stakes football. The 2026 college football playoff dates and locations. Of course, first round, again, on-campus sites. Friday, December 19th, you've got one game that night. And then Saturday, you've got three playoff games, early afternoon, late afternoon, and evening. The quarterfinals are on Wednesday, December 31st. That's the Cotton Bowl in the evening. And then Thursday, January 1st, you've got the Orange Bowl, the Rose Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl. All of those are quarterfinals. It, let, let's move on, and we'll, we'll come back to this. Semifinals. Thursday, January 8th, 2026, you've got the Fiesta Bowl in the evening. Friday, January 9th, you've got the Peach Bowl in the evening. And then the CFP National Championship game is going to be Monday, January 19th, at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens, Florida. I love the idea of Thursday and Friday night semifinals. Standalone windows have proven to be incredibly successful for college football. Uh, and I'm also noticing that neither the Rose Bowl nor the Sugar Bowl is moving off of their January 1st date. Now, this is only the first two years. I knew that the Rose Bowl wanted to keep their time slot. I am not sure about the Sugar Bowl. Like, obviously, this has to do with rotations, etc., but... It's something to watch going forward, I think. Overall, we can argue about whether or not we should have expanded the playoff, but since we have, I do like the way that the schedule breaks down. Like, I think, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. But I, I like the schedule so far on this. A uh, quick reminder, uh, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. This is a uh, one-man operation. So, you know, every like and subscribe, every podcast review, every share, uh, really helps me out along with picking up something from the merch store. So uh, head over to winningcureseverything.com slash store, and you can check out some stuff there. Or actually, uh, if you're watching the show on YouTube, it's just right here. It's, it, whatever. If you're watching on Rumble or, or somewhere else, you're not going to find it there. Go to winningcureseverything.com. All right. Writing the times down. Is the SEC sticking with eight games in the conference schedule after 2023? You know what, I'm going to redo that because I don't think I sounded right. <laughs> I don't think that sounded exactly right. Let's uh, let's start it off again and, and make it sound nice and crisp, huh? Uh, is the SEC sticking with eight games in the conference schedule after 2023, or will they vote at the spring meetings in Destin to move to nine games? And if so, what all else will that entail? Now, both SI's Ross Dellinger and the Athletics Seth Emerson have reported on this in the past week. And the decision appears to be about as clear as mud right now. Greg Sankey has stated for about a month now that the decision will likely be made at this month's spring meetings in Dustin, which uh, is actually going to include Texas and Oklahoma in attendance for the first time. Emerson detailed the decision that the 16 schools have to vote on. For a year now, and this is a quote from his article, the conference has been down to two options. A nine-game conference schedule where every team has three annual opponents and rotates the other 12 teams, or an eight-game schedule where everyone has one annual opponent. No more divisions, no pods. The nine-game conference schedule made sense because you, you get more annual conference rivalries every year. You can have Alabama versus Auburn, and you can have both Alabama, Tennessee, and Auburn, Georgia. Big ratings games each year. If you stay at eight games, Alabama, Tennessee, and Auburn, Georgia end up being played two times every four years. Personally, I think going with eight games, like splitting it up and getting that that break in between, um, you know, at least for the every year games, I think that would make them a little more fresh. Like having seven or seven different opponents every two years would kind of be must-see TV. Uh, but truth be told, for TV purposes, nine conference games is, is the right decision. You get more of the bigger annual matchups, which get the better ratings uh, guaranteed. Uh, if you want to keep your distribution partner happy, this is the way to do it. Everyone kind of assumed that this thing was just going to move to nine games, like the Big Ten, the Big 12, and the Pac-12. 
But as Emerson put in his article, when everyone met at last year's spring meetings, uh, they realized that they did not have a consensus on this. Uh, from the article, it said schools such as Kentucky uh, preferred eight-game schedules because they don't care about more than one annual rivalry. Uh, their big rival is, is Louisville, and it's a non-conference game. And they liked eight-game conference schedules for competitive and financial reasons. Uh, one fewer non-conference game means one fewer chance to schedule a very winnable home game. These are all viable reasons, but when it comes to the greater good of the conference, you could probably tell Kentucky to just suck it up, buttercup, right? Uh, but I don't think it's that easy. At that time, you know, we weren't sure if the CFP was expanding. We know that now. The SEC was not sure who was going to pay for canceling non-conference games that have already been scheduled well out in the future. And the biggest one, whether or not ESPN was even going to pay them more money for more games. Like, the ESPN-SEC contract is for eight SEC conference games each season for each team that ESPN contract was worth 811 million dollars per year for 10 years and it was signed prior to the Oklahoma and Texas uh joining of the conference the pro rata clause in the contract is believed to increase the payment by an amount equal to what each school was already getting so around 58 million dollars per school which means 927 million per year but the SEC and ESPN are basically still at the negotiating table because, as the SEC has already pointed out to ESPN, this is not just two extra teams. This isn't the Big Ten adding Rutgers and Maryland. This is Texas and Oklahoma. This is two of the premier brands in the history of the sport, which means more marquee matchups, much, much bigger games. Uh, but ESPN has not announced a new deal yet, which means right now there's no additional money for more games. There's no additional money for bringing in Texas and Oklahoma, really. Uh, if you're the SEC, why would you play more conference games if you're not going to make more money off of it? Aside from getting Texas, Texas A&M, and, and Alabama, Tennessee every year, like what else could ESPN be asking for? Like, Would they want an agreement that even with nine games, the conference teams are all required to play one P5 non-conference game? Um, that ESPN gets to set the matchups? Like, I, I'm not sure what else ESPN could want and whether or not the SEC would even be willing to, to do that. So now... If you're a school that's been planning to vote for nine conference games, but now there's no financial incentive to replace the extra home game that you're likely to lose every other year, you know, in a four or five uh, conference schedule or four home and five away conference schedule, like, do you do you switch your vote back to eight? Like, my belief is that something is going to get done, but not at the spring meetings. Uh, ESPN and the SEC will agree on nine games eventually, but as we've talked about in the Pac-12 negotiations, ESPN. They're a little dry on cash at the moment. I mean, they're not making cuts, or they are making cuts. They're not spending a ton of money. Uh, there's the CFP, NBA, and UFC deals coming up that they're going to have to spend on. So are they just going to say, nah, we're good with what we got? Uh, who's to say? But if ESPN says that they're paying more or they're not paying more, I think you're you're going to see eight games. If ESPN says yes, then we're going to see nine. Uh, but nothing's going to be agreed to until that point. All right, let's write down our times again. Uh, let's talk Big 12. Brett Yormark has talked about innovation ever since he took over as Big 12 commissioner. So what does he have up his sleeve now? At the recent spring fiesta, uh, he talked to Brandon Marcello at 247, uh, Dennis Dodd at CBS, among others, about a couple of things that will make your ears perk up a little bit. Obviously, Yormark comes from the world of professional athletics. Uh, he was with the Nets before this. So when he starts talking about things that have been successful for the NFL, NBA, etc., it should not be really surprising. Your mark brought up how the conference is exploring ways to expand their reach geographically and on the media landscape. The conference is expected to make an announcement in the next couple of weeks about playing select football games at the 53,500-seat Estadio BVA. That's the stadium in Monterey, Mexico. And basketball games at the 22,300-seat arena CDMX in Mexico City. For basketball, they're looking at Kansas versus Houston being held there, and I would imagine a big reason is because Kansas basketball fans are going to travel uh, just about anywhere to watch their Jayhawks. Uh, it makes sense for the NBA and for the NFL to take their game international, right? Home field is not a huge thing in those sports. You can package uh, professional athletics anywhere, and, and it's going to be able to draw because it's the highest level of the sport. The Big 12 is not even the highest level of college football. Maybe, maybe basketball, but not football. So how well this thing does is going to be incredibly interesting to me. Like, what are the crowds going to look like? How excited will local fans be about a TCU versus Oklahoma State game? 
or or Texas Tech versus Houston. Like those matchups don't always sell out on home campuses. So that's going to be really intriguing. Uh, the other things that stood out was the changes to game coverage that he talked about. The Big 12 is planning to upgrade its television presentations with behind-the-scenes access during games, including in-game interviews with coaches and pre- and post-game access inside the locker rooms. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this because, in all honesty, I don't care to hear what coaches or players are saying in the middle of a game. Like, emotions run high. All this does really is sets up guys to make mistakes, especially when they're not used to having mics on them all the time. Uh, There are very few sacred places that the media does not have access to anymore. And the locker room and, you know, in-game, on-the-court kind of stuff, that just happens to be one of them that's left. At the same time, I get it, right? I get the direction everything's going nowadays. Uh, The the behind-the-scenes access is expected to begin as soon as this football season. It's going to help out with social media engagement. You're going to see more clips on Twitter and Instagram, etc. I'm sure it helped in negotiations with Fox and ESPN, Uh, that they can have a broadcast that's different from the stuff that they're going to get with the SEC and the Big Ten. Like, your mark has already shown he's willing to experiment, whether it's by, you know, hiring uh, Shaq as the DJ at the Big 12 basketball tournament or or launching youth clinics with Big 12 coaches at historic Rucker Park in New York. Uh, This is just more of the same. Like, truth be told, as a conference that's not on the level of the SEC or the Big Ten, stuff like this is necessary. Anything that he can do to generate interest in his conference is going to be welcome because they have to draw eyeballs. Like, I don't blame him at all for doing this. Uh, and it's it's yet another thing that I'm very curious to see the results. So I may not like some of it, but maybe they can change my mind. We, we shall see. We shall see. Two years ago, Jimbo Fisher told the Houston Touchdown Club that Texas A&M would, quote, beat Nick Saban's ass. Now, this time, in the same location... It was Brian Kelly that was feeling a bit chesty about his Bayou Bengals. November 4th was always going to be a huge day for the 2023 college football season, but after Brian Kelly's comments at the Houston Touchdown Club, it does ratchet up the temperature a little bit on LSU's visit to Bryant-Denny Stadium that afternoon. Brent Zwerneman, uh, who covers at Texas A&M and more for the Houston Chronicle, also known as the guy who uh, is known for breaking the Texas uh, Texas and Oklahoma to the SEC story, Uh, He was in attendance for Kelly's appearance at the Houston Touchdown Club, and he tweeted some of what the LSU coach said to the Pro Tigers crowd. Kelly was asked by a fan what he thinks about Texas and Oklahoma entering the SEC in 2024. He said, Greg Sankey is paid way more than me to make those decisions, which is pretty funny because Sankey doesn't make near what Brian Kelly makes. Uh, He talked about the importance of recruiting in Houston. Uh, Quote, it's pretty well documented that our best defensive player is from this area. But what really caught everyone's attention was BK saying, I love the environment of a college stadium. I love coming out on that field. I love beating Alabama. And of course, the crowd erupted. After beating Alabama in 2019, Ed Orgeron was filmed telling his team, we're going to beat their ass in recruiting. We're going to beat their ass every time they see us. Roll Tide, what? F you. Everyone immediately knew that Nick Saban was going to have the next matchup circled. Like, before the next season's game in Baton Rouge, Saban was on the field and he told CBS, LSU beat us last year, so they probably have some confidence that they can play well against Alabama. We're going to have to change the way they think when it comes to that as well. Alabama ended up winning the game 55-17. to Now, I am not naive enough to think that Alabama's going to put that kind of beating on Kelly's Tigers. That Orgeron team was uh, really not good, and that Alabama team was a different level. I'm also not naive enough to view this as actual disrespect or a real slight to the tide, right? LSU beat Alabama last year in Baton Rouge in an absolutely incredible football game. They deserve to celebrate it. Since 1981, LSU is only 4-17-1 at home against Alabama. It, It doesn't happen often. Since the game of the century, number one versus number two back in 2011 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama is now 10 and two against LSU after last season's game. So again, it hasn't happened much. But man, there's been an awful lot of people giving Saban and the Tide some bulletin board material since last season ended. And Brian Kelly is just the latest. Like I'm excited to see what goes down in November on this one. Former Texas and Nebraska quarterback Casey Thompson entered the transfer portal over the weekend and has already had a visit to Auburn and coach Hugh Freeze. 
Now, Thompson started for most of Cesar Sarkeesian's first season at Texas, including going 20 of 34 for 388 yards, five TDs, and zero interceptions in a 55 to 48 loss to Oklahoma. And then he went 30 of 43 for 358 yards with six touchdowns and one interception in a 57 to 56 overtime loss to Kansas. Both losses, which you could hardly blame the kid for. Now, he finished the 5-7 and seven campaign with the Longhorns with 24 touchdowns and only 9 interceptions. He completed 63.2% uh, of his passes, and he averaged over 8 yards per an attempt. So then he transfers to Nebraska because Quinn Ewers was coming in. He was going to be the guy. And in a season that saw Coach Scott Frost lose his job after Week 2, uh, Casey Thompson ended up completing 63.1% of his passes with 17 TDs and 10 interceptions. He averaged 8.8 .8 yards per attempt. Now, I don't know that I could hold anything that happened last year against him, but those are still pretty decent numbers. Now, he has shown some mobility, although last year he was negative 21 yards rushing on 56 attempts. He sat back in the pocket a lot in Mark Whipple's offense, which, by the way, now that, now that we think about it, we joked about Nebraska being Whipple's last payday before retirement, but did that dude really just collect the checks and disappear? Like, he's not working anywhere else right now. Uh, as one Twitter response stated to me, like he, he's likely on a golf course in Arizona as we speak. I'm a little bit jealous of it. But anyway, back to Thompson. There are a few different places that he could get a starting job. Obviously, uh, there's several at the G5 level, most, loaded, uh, most notably, of course, Tom Herman and Florida Atlantic. Herman is the one who recruited Thompson to Texas. He was fired after the 2020 season, of course. Thompson does a whole lot of what Herman would need, and it's a job at FAU that he might be overqualified for. Man, he could help the Owls transition into the AAC really, really well. In the SEC... There's Florida, although word is that they're pretty happy with, uh, with Graham Mertz. Of course, Auburn, they just had Michigan State transfer. Peyton Thorne announced his commitment there. Uh, nothing looks great back in the Big 12, although, I mean, it might would be interesting to see him in a Kendall Bryles offense at TCU. Uh, in the Pac-12, like, could he start over Rashada or, or Drew Pine? Um, and that's, that's over at Arizona State. Like, Oklahoma State back in the Big 12, they've got Garrett Wrangell and Gunnar Gundy. I, I think Thompson would likely start there. But my guess is that he's going to probably end up back with Tom Herman. But as of this recording, it's not done yet. So we're going to have to, we're going to, have to see what happens. Uh, like, like most of you, I am very curious how this one ends up. All right. Uh, that's going to wrap up this edition of Winning Cures Everything. If you are headed out to Bill Street Music Festival on, uh, on Saturday, hit me up. I'll be down there seeing uh, Hardy and Hailstorm and Government Mule, etc. Should be a good time. It's back down on the river here in beautiful Memphis, Tennessee. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, again, if you haven't already, click that like button for me. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and the podcast. Remember the goal. I'm trying to get to 10,000 subscribers this year. And, uh, and also, jump in the comments. I want to know what you guys think about everything we discussed today. Uh, make sure you get signed up over at BetUS, where the game begins. And as always, if there's something that you want to talk to me about on the show, uh, feel free to hit me up. Again, it's GaryWCE on Twitter, or you can email me, Gary at winningcureseverything.com. Or as I mentioned, you can always toss it in the comments or a podcast review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Until next time, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Of course, God bless college football. And hopefully, all of your tickets cash this weekend. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question... You can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.